All right. So, um, moving into uh, the Representing the Black Home panel. This panel explores the myriad of ways black diasporic communities represent the interiority of home. For this conversation, we are seeking to understand how black home is reflected in visual, audio, and multimedia um, forms. Uh, we'll be talking with our panelists, these artists and designers, um, working in uh, a variety of mediums. Um, our moderator for this uh, panel is Michelle J. Wilkerson. Woo woo! Um, PhD or doctor, my bad, let me back that up. Dr. Michelle J. Wilkerson um, is a curator of architecture and design at the Smithsonian Institution, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, she's also a co, a co curator for the 2024 Smithsonian Design Triennial at Cooper Hewitt Museum. And 2019 through 2020, Wilkerson was a Loeb Fellow at Harvard Graduate School of Design. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. Um, and I hand it over to you. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, I can hear myself. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to say that I feel like a, um, an all-star in the sense that I've been here since the 2015 uh, conference, and this is one of my favorite places to come to. So thanks so much to the students and the organizers. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in. Our panel is titled Representing the Black Home, and I'm now gonna introduce our panelists. Uh, Ekwa Msangi in the middle. Equa is an award-winning and critically acclaimed feature. Equa's award-winning and critically acclaimed feature film, *Farewell Amour*, premiered in competition in the 2020 Sundance Film Festival, and also won the Sundance Amazon Producers Award, among many other distinctions. She has also directed for television, including Disney's *Growing Up* docu-series, Showtime's *Sultry: Three Women*, and Hulu's *Saint X* season finale. She is a 2020 BAFTA Breakthrough winner, a 2022 USA Artist Fellow, and a Reframe Rise Director Fellow. Equa is currently in development on several projects, including a miniseries adaptation of the award-winning book, Behold the Dreamers. Next up, Gabriela de Matos, and it says Gab de Matos here, so should we call you Gab? Okay. She is the curator of the Brazilian Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennial in this year, 2023, alongside Paolo Tavares. Their Terra Pavilion won the Golden Line for Best National Participation. She graduated from the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism of the Pontificio Catholic University of Minas Gerais in 2010. She's also co-president of the Brazilian Institute of Architects, Department of Sao Paulo. Gab investigates both structural racism and its implications in urban planning and architecture produced in Africa and its diaspora, focusing on Brazil. She's the founder of Arquitectas Negra Project, which maps the production of black Brazilian women architects and is the publisher of the book Arquitectas Negras, Volume 1. She directs the architecture studio, Gabriela de Matos, founded in 2014, and she was awarded Architect of the Year 2020 by IAB-RI. I'm not sure what the letters stand for, but maybe you can explain it later. <laughs> And finally, Michael Macmillan on the end. Michael is a London-based writer, playwright, artist, scholar of Vincentian migrant heritage. He's best known for the beloved and much praised installation, The Front Room, which has been iterated in the Netherlands, Curacao, Johannesburg, and France. The work also inspired the BBC4 documentary, Tales from the Front Room in 20, 2007, and that is now permanently at the Museum of the Home alongside his film installation, Waiting for Myself to Appear. Michael's plays have been widely produced and his recent publications include the multimedia anthology, Sonic Vibrations, Sound Systems, Lover's Rock, and Dub, and his revised edition, The Front Room, Diaspora Migrant Aesthetics in the Home. His recent installation, I Miss My Mum's Cooking, was nominated for a Brighton Fringe Award. Michael has a first arts doctorate from Middlesex University 2010 and is currently an associate lecturer in cultural and historical studies at the London College of Fashion and a research associate with VIAD at the University of Johannesburg. So welcome our panelists.
I, I really love the title of our um, our panel because to me the word uh, representing it also takes me back to like the old days of hip hop and representing, kind of shouting out and showing where you're from. And then even thinking about academia, that kind of um, the politics of representation, sometimes the burden of representation. Um, so I want to kind of dig into all of that and just get started. So with our panel title, Representing the Black Home, I'd like each of you to please share how your practice has engaged ideas about home or the black home, and why the subject of home has appealed to you. Shall I begin? Yeah. Go for it. Since my picture up there already. Um, so I, I need to say basically, first of all, I'm born in the UK, parents from St. Vincent. I identify as black British, and I have to big up my sister here. Dawn, put your hand up, Dawn, in the house. My house. Dawn. And her sister, and her, her husband, sorry, Dev. Um, and I'm going to talk a moment about the fact that Dawn and Dev have lived in the US for 30 years, over 30 years, but their accent has not changed. It says something about diaspora. But this is the front room, an example of the front room that we grew up in. And this is a book, it's here, out now, available on Amazon. The front room, it emanates from the Victorian parlor. It's a product of migration. It, it isn't so what you would find in the Caribbean. And why is it a product of migration? Because, and it, through my practice, that the struggle and aspiration here is important. When that generation came over here post-1948, and, no, and I'm ambivalent about the term Windrush because it pres presumes that we arrived in the UK in 1948 when there's been a black presence since the Romans in the UK. 20,000 black people in London during the 18th century. But okay, so my parents' generation um, saw science says no Irish, no dogs, no coloreds. They found it easier to find a job than to find somewhere to live. And in once they created the home using possibly the partner hand, they created this wonderful room. I need to say that it's, my dad may have used it to entertain, but it was my mum who dressed it and controlled how. I said the Victorian parlor, so it comes with all of that baggage of the coloniality, those bourgeois values, including aspiration and respectability. Here at the Museum of the Home, it's permanent, and that's politically important for me, because me barn, I mean, I'm not going anywhere. And I will drop into a bit of nation language, because in the UK, Jamaican is the most powerful culture, and because they all think we're Jamaican, I won't deny it if you think I'm Jamaican. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'll drop into that, because it's easy, it's of my body, because the home is of my body. I need to say that the original iteration at the Jeffrey Museum was the West Indian front room. It was the most successful exhibition there because it went beyond the black experience to other migrant communities, including white working class communities. So the power is that something black created can have this resonance beyond that. And now I just call it the front room. Um, I'm interested in the material culture and how that relates to our bodies. And being here at Harvard, and I'm, I've been bragging to my friend, I mean, here at Harvard, you know, uh, how, how, in a sense, it connects with who we are in terms of effect, um, not simply in terms of feeling, but also our spirituality. And music is a key aspect of that. I'll leave it. I could talk, but you have to read the book. The other thing I want to mention is an essay here in by Stuart Hall, <laughs> sorry, where he says, and I'm going to park. He says that the front room is a conservative element of black life that the generality of society never quite understands. So conservatism resides within the black home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually a really wonderful place to pick up. Um, I, too was born and raised in multiple places. My parents were Fulbright scholars um, on the West Coast. When I was born in Oakland, um, we moved to Kenya. My family's originally from Tanzania. I've lived in Brooklyn or in New York for the past almost 30 years now. Um, so I identify with a lot of different places. Um, I identify with being an immigrant and a foreigner and an outside observer 
to a number of different things and finding um, uh, the, the threads of connection, um, like front room parlors. <laughs> um, and and the, the place that I'd love to pick up from you is what music meant to me growing up and what a big part of my last film, Farewell Amour, um, focuses on is that part of the connection and the food and the things, um, you know, the image there of the praying hands is something that was in every house that we went to um, growing up, which was part of respectability. Jesus is the head of this home. Everybody had that plaque. Um, the company that makes it apparently has gone out of business, so I had an artist make that for my film. But um, that was, it was almost like a, protect, a protective sort of, this is, this is who we are, all right? This is, this, is, this is where we are, this is who we are. Um, the, the clothing, the, you know, all of those things, but music was definitely um, a huge connector um, in terms of not only messaging, um, you know, at that time we didn't have Afrobeats because Afrobeats is actually quite new. <laughs> um, Congolese music was the biggest, you know, sort of mover and shaker at the time and then apartheid songs and like Miri Makeba and you know that kind of stuff. So I remember as a child learning about Africa from listening to the African Students Union who were collected in our home eating particular foods and reminiscing about the homeland and what they were going to do once they finished their education and went back um, and wanted to bring that into or little bits of that into my work and Feeling really, um, it, it, it was such a wonderful experience to premiere, to premiere my film at a very white festival, which is Sundance, and have all these people from all over the world who are not necessarily African at all, who could relate to a lot of those different things in different ways, even if it be, you know, my nanny or my neighbor or my bus driver, you know reminds me of that, or I've heard stories. Um, so just kind of seeing the way that the threads run through all of our cultures, but specifically black cultures and diaspora. Well, um, I think uh, in the last years, uh, the house, this theme can, uh, has become more clear in my work uh, I've been research about uh, Afro-Brazilian architecture for like almost eight years. And in Brazil, uh, in architecture in this field, we have uh, some problem to recognize uh, the Afro-Brazilian architecture in the university. They just, uh, our history, our architecture history used to tell just the story uh, about the architecture. Uh, it starts in colonization. They don't look for the indigenous architecture or uh, African architecture in Brazil. So, and, and the house is the origin of this architecture because it's the, the first, uh, gesture of uh, build and of um, protect the community that they make in, in Brazilian territory. So I started to investigate about the house and uh, in the other way uh, I have my studio so I start to, to design for black women in the last days, uh, in the last years, and uh, I started to, to analyze how this, this share of experience and technical uh, way of think architecture and of build, how this is different when I am uh, creating architecture for white people. So I'm um, in this point uh, trying to, to understand how, and in the other way, my house, of course, my house with my daughter and how I 
think about uh, that space too, because there I'm not an architect. I'm just um, a woman, a mother with a daughter in that space. So I think everything is centered in the, in the house. And uh, as I observed um, in this, this, these years that I've been researching Afro-Brazilian architecture, uh, it's the floor that we are, uh, I'm sorry guys, my uh, colonial language is Portuguese, <laughs> it's not English, but I'm trying <laughs> to make you understand. Well, when I'm uh, in the, the earth, the contact of the earth, the floor, this is very meaningful for this architecture. And that what that was we 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 made in Venice and it was very in our pavilion, it was very significant because uh, that pavilion is um, is uh, modernism. Brazilian architecture that it's well known in every place, and um, uh, our colleagues thought that was like um, how can I say it? Um, a critical, and it was of course to put earth in the modernism floor. So and this was the point. So I think the house has so many aspects that we have to to reclaim to represent what I've what, not just I but this group of Afro-Brazilian architects been doing because I think we are not the start we are just the continuation of this history. Right, I love the, um, how you ended that, and it, I think it does come back to that question about when we have these opportunities to represent um, the kind of responsibility that comes with that. And I wanted to ask each of you to talk a little bit about, you know, did you feel a certain type of responsibility to represent either home in a certain way or your cultural identity in a certain way through the work that you've been doing? I think that's an interesting question as an artist. Uh, I always begin from that I'm trying to speak to myself. If I speak to myself on a human level, then hopefully it will resonate with others. What's interesting about creating the front room, though, is even today with the living room, and so the front room, like the living room and the sitting room, is the public space and the private domain, where we perform how we want to think we want to be. And that is important within the black world. So we think we're the only ones that has that vase uniquely. We think we're very individual. But Can the, I ask you a question real quick? Go on. Is that the room that nobody's supposed to sit yes. in? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an uncomfortable space. <laughs> and uh, you see here the sofa. We didn't cover it in um, plastic because that's an American plastic practice that through diaspora and people started to come to New York, they started to bring it back to the UK. Um, I have a response. I mean, I think like Toni Morrison, I'm speaking to my people. But I have to also, it has to please me first. Um, but this notion that somehow we believe we're individual, but in actual fact, these, com these practices are common, is fascinating. Yes, and that is how I came to engage with the front room. Because growing up, I thought this place was kitsch, really. I mean, it's like, really? And then I, s and I was doing some oral histories, and I think, hey, I'm a deja vu. What's this? I'm in the same room. Ah, oh, it's the front room. This is worth unpacking. I also need to say that as the front room, I'm not the first person to create it. It's become a kind of emblem of the kind of Windrush Black History Month industry. And you can hear my cynicism in that, really. It's a heritage orientated da 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 da. I have an issue with that because it doesn't problematize what is the front room. It's oppressive on some level. It is not for comfort. It's patriarchal. There are types of violence that happen within that space, yeah? And I rebelled against it. So I am questioning it in some level to think about what is the legacy of home now in a time when in the UK, some people who've been there for 50 years are being treated as illegal immigrants, are being detained, deported, and sent back home to places they don't know. So colonialism, neo-colonialism, 
and the neo market economy is still alive. So I want to speak to that in thinking about the home. But how also the things, and I'm so glad we had the, the moisturizer in the toilet, and I have to go back, because it's Nivea. So the brand, it's Nivea. If it was anything else, I don't think I'll use it. It had to be Nivea. <laughs> it had to be Nivea. So the brands are really quite important here. Picking up on music, today I know I can't live without music, but music is so important for us within the black world because as Cornel West says, you know, we've given something to humanity out of pain and the racist terror. West Indians were barred from clubs and pubs, so they resorted to playing music on the radiogram at the back there. And my parents had an eclectic Jim, Jim Reeves, mm -hmm. no, Jim Reeves, Elvis, Mighty Spiral, Nat King Cole. This is where the first house parties began, the first blues parties and sound systems began through this instrument until the police arrived to shut it down. So, Responsibility, yes, I'm responsibility to myself as an artist first and foremost. Yes, responsibility. Um, as a storyteller, I definitely feel that, let me start by saying the whole reason I became a filmmaker was unlike a lot of my peers in film school who came to film because of their love of a particular movie or a particular genre or whatever it was, I came to film because of how much I hated the content that I had growing up. We had D-level Rambo knockoffs for pretty much all of my life, British Top of the Pops at some point. Um, and maybe towards the end, we had like Yo! MTV raps, but it was you know a really old rerun of the Cosby show here and there, but it was really, really cheap, terrible stuff that just did not reflect the interesting, funny, dramatic lives of the people that I saw surrounding me. And I come from a family of storytellers in terms of my father always made a point of talking about lineage and heritage and who came first and what their stories were. So stories were just part of it. And then also being an immigrant, you depend on stories as a way to know what's going on in the home country. So the relative who shows up, who's like, girl, let me tell you what they've been doing and who has a baby and who's been with who and you know, just all of those things where that's, that's the news, that's what it was, but I never saw that anywhere. And so my reaction to that was to become a storyteller. I also come from East Africa, which has a very old history of filmmaking, a long history of filmmaking. There have been big Hollywood films that have shot in East Africa from the 30s, but you'll never know because there are no African people in them. <laughs> it's animals and it's savannas and it's white people finding themselves and finding love and somewhere in Africa and out of Africa and nowhere in Africa. Those are all real titles <laughs> of films that have been made in Africa with no African people in it. Um, and so coming to the States and representing East Africa, where it was, <laughs> thank you, um, where the only representations that people had visual reminders of were starving Ethiopians, um, or at some point was Africans in West Africa, maybe we've, or South African townships, or very specific things, but East Africa people remembered animals more than they remembered people. And so I felt a responsibility to tell stories about people. And I'm really stickler about, I've had plenty of Africa animal projects that have been offered to me, high level, sort of like, you know, funding is available, Julia Roberts is attached, and I'm like, absolutely not, I will not do it. <laughs> I can't because cause for me, what's um, most important to me is what I learned at home, which was stories about people and like the interesting things that our lives um, pertain and all of the details, which includes accents, which you mentioned regarding your sister, um, and being really stickler about what people sound like as well, because that's, we sound differently and there's reasons behind that. 
Well, um, I think migration is a pretty huge topic in my research because um, we have to understand that, I don't know if all of you know, but Brazil uh, was the country that received half of people that were enslaved and bring to Brazil. Half, half is just like six million of people. And uh, so we have this uh, cultural matrix that it's very African, very African. And um, the system, the society, the university, they all try to erase this, but they, we are talking about this. They love to tell how we are known by uh, carnival, samba, and, and the food that we eat. But um, in architecture, they want to tell that uh, black people just construct, was just the physical... Uh, Manual labor. Yes, labor. It doesn't have a, a knowledge uh, besides, yeah, uh, yes, um, and we try to to prove this in university, but it's very difficult to um, to uh, create this directly relation with countries in Africa that produce this kind of architecture because we has the we have this uh, huge country with uh, continental dimensions, and we have um, four steps of the slavery in the country. So uh, it's very difficult to identify uh, where the people came. And, but we have some elements that people know and see in the city, like Sankofa, it's all over the place, like in the, the houses and all over the place. Everybody knows the, the symbol, but doesn't know the history behind. Um, the uh, Arcos, how can I say? Arcos, Arcos and uh, this kind of elements. But um, we are trying to, um, Besides this, uh, this uh, directly reference, we are trying to prove that it's uh, a way of thinking architecture that is different of this way of thinking, this white way, and these parameters that they they build and and they use to define what is architecture and what is an architecture, who can make and who can't make. We have some places uh, of memory for us, like uh, Terreiros de Candomblé, Ilés, Quilombos, and et cetera. And uh, these places like uh, Terreiro da Casa Branca, that it's uh, Ilé, uh, the first one in Brazil, is still is, still it is there, and uh, has some problem with the land. They are always struggling to maintain the land. And uh, we have this history that uh, after Oscar Niemeyer project a pretty horrible boat in the, <laughs> in the land, uh, the government starts to protect. So we, we need a white man to, to design a thing to the government it starts to, to look at. So, and we have other histories like uh, in Rio de Janeiro, we have, uh, uh, we had the house of Tia Ciata that was a black woman in the, uh, like in the last years of uh, slavery. And uh, she migrated from Bahia to Rio de Janeiro because it was, Rio de Janeiro was the, the last um, step can I say this, a step of the slavery in Brazil. So they, they had this technology and they were bringing a lot of people to Rio de Janeiro. And this caused um, communication. So some people, we had the, the Bahia diaspora in Brazil that bring some people from, to, to Rio that came from Bahia. And Tia Seattle was this woman and she had a house and she used to protect 
the black people that were uh, in Rio de Janeiro. She has a terreiro, a, a house of candomblé uh, in the yard, the backyard. And she used to put in the front room uh, a kind of music that was um, legally in, the, in that moment, because legal, because somebody was not. Yes, yes. So she put in the front room this music, and the samba was in the backyard. And uh, the first samba that is registered in Brazil uh, was registered there in the in she's house. Yeah, and it's a house. Wow, that's a, that's amazing. I'm just thinking about you know the floor plan and you know whether the front room is actually in the front, but in this case, making it the space for um, the appropriate behavior that's sanctioned, but being able to protect the behavior that isn't right. Um, with the um, music and sound, I wanted to talk a little bit and ask you a question, Equa. Uh, your film Farewell Amor has been called a moving exploration of the meaning of home, which is I think lovely for someone to say about anything. Um, as a filmmaker, what was important to you visually and sonically to include in exploring home? And can you talk about things like color choices, set design, the score, um, elements that you use to kind of make the characters really appeal to the, the viewer related to this idea of finding home or loss of home? And maybe just give us a summary as well of what the film is about. Yeah, so uh, Farewell Amour is a film that explores the relationship of a family that's been separated due to migration, visa migration issues for 17 years. So it starts with their reunion and them trying to get to know one another after this long time of separation, but obviously everybody has changed. And um, they're using dance and music as a way of reconnecting with each other and with themselves. And um, I decided to, at the time that I was writing this film, I was doing a lot of dance, <laughs> specifically Angolan um, Kizomba and Kuduro, which are you know specific dances to Angola. But it, Kizomba is a very beautiful, romantic couples dance, which is not usually the kind of dance that you think about when you think of African dancing. You think of like the fertility dance or something. Um, and I just thought that was so great that we have romantic dances too, man. <laughs> we can do that, rumba. Um, and so, so I wanted to represent Angola. I've never been to Angola, and I don't speak Portuguese. And you know, it's not my country as such. Um, and really, if we're talking about language, these people should be speaking Portuguese at home. <laughs> but that, in terms of the politics of film business, would impact my ability to make this film or sell this film or get it made. Um, so they are speaking in English, but we spent months working with a dialect coach to make sure that the kind of English they spoke made sense for who they are, where they were, where their cult cultural and class backgrounds were, educational backgrounds. Did they go to school in the north or the south? Did they go to college? Did they do this? Um, and just sort of really getting into the weeds of that. Um, and then obviously curating very specific music that they would move to and dance to and how to capture that as well. Um, <clears throat> and, and it was interesting because I feel like the inclusion of music as far as reading a script is sort of what helped to get my film made <laughs> because there were all of these people who were like, ooh, African music, this is amazing. <laughs> um, and then when they saw the music <laughs> and were like, I can't, I don't know what they're saying because of these accents. Then it became this other conversation around like, well, we need subtitles. And I was like, no, we don't. We actually don't because you can see what they're doing and you can tell what they're meaning. And so it became this whole political maneuver of you know, trying to tell this story with just using the bodies and the language and the colors. Um, you know, I used a black cinematographer who, you know, I sort of told him what it is that I was trying to do. And, you know, using artwork and using sort of aesthetics of black people, um, curating what they wore and curating how we set up the space. And 
a home of these new immigrants and what that would look like and how they interact in the home. So this father who's never met his daughter, would he, for expediency, you know, my editor was like, let's just get him in the room and then he has to have the conversation with her. And it's like, they would never do that because he doesn't know his daughter and it's a daughter. You know, there's a way in which we will act in our homes. There's a way in which we um, interact with each other. And so having actors who were from the diaspora um, and from Africa, who could deliver those things inherently um, was really important to me too. So even casting choices um, made a really big made a really big difference. Yeah, I'm just looking. Oh my goodness, it's almost time for Q and A. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, well, let's let's do that because I think that's the point of being here. It should be conversational. Um, I, if you do have questions, please raise your hand. Um, the question I was just going to put out to all of you is to maybe talk a little bit about the reception to your work, because I think it's really interesting for talking about representing, understanding the kind of reception that people have. So maybe you can start speaking about that while we take questions from the audience. Um, for me, in terms of the front room, it's been humbling for me, the response, because, um, and from different communities, particularly black communities, because it allows us the, a, a, a space to talk about growing up and our interiority, our subjectivities, our desires, about love, about pleasure within the home, because we're often represented within the mainstream as loitering on the street, as if we have no homes, we have no family. And doing the front room allows us to begin to remember, remember, these things, this material culture, the crochet, for instance, made by women, the Last Supper on the wall, and you have to have the Last Supper, even if you're not religious. Can you stay uh, on that a while and maybe list out some of the kinds of material culture and aesthetic objects that are in these rooms? Because we, you know, we've seen one image, but we'd love to okay. hear some more. So the wallpaper and the carpet never seem to match, but it doesn't matter. It's colorful anyway. <laughs> yeah. You have the glass cabinet, which only function to display things you never use. But being older now, and having in inherited things from my parents who are gone, I understand the value of displaying things you're not going to use. I get it. Um, um, the de ornaments, the trinkets. Uh, um, the drinks cart? The, the bar cart, the drinks cart? <laughs> The bar, the bar, yes, the bar. And it, so the room is a series of contradictions. You have alcohol, and yes, you have religious identity in there at the same time. Yeah, of course. You have the sofa, and the sofa is going to stick to you because of the plastic. You have the coffee table. You have artificial the doilies. Now, the crochet is very significant because crochet was introduced by the missionaries, but it's what black women Caribbean have had. Creolized crochet made it colorful and sculptural. That is incredible. And very rare, you can't, so I have my mom's collection. And what is interesting is I have people who are families whose parents are going and say, we're going to throw it in a skip. I said, no, I'll come and look at it and I may take things. So this is important within the museum to give a new type of knowledge to, in terms of the collection and the archive that we bring in. We are contesting the collection now. That, you know, our, our material culture has value. You know, um, and as a people, we don't collect antiques. We're not into antiques. We, everything must be new. And today is that plasma screen. You see, I have money now. <laughs> <laughs> I have money. That is the radiogram today. So yeah. Yeah. it's so layered. It's so comp. The other thing that's significant, I come from a working class background, yeah? So people say, no, we didn't. We had more books. We didn't have ornaments. So class is a dynamic here within this. Our parents had a piano at one point. And piano is a signification of class, isn't it? But I don't know why they put, the, because none of us were interested in playing it, and they never gave us any <laughs> lessons to learn how to play it. So I wondered why they had the piano in there. That's not the point. I could go on, but uh, yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, can I say yes? Oh, yeah, go ahead, and then we'll take the question. I was just going to slip so, a question in there. Do you think? that the cabinet, the glass cabinet with the things that we never touch um, is kind of a replacement of almost like veneration in terms of like our ancestral hand-me-downs that 
you know, are placed there because for remembrance and because they're important, but you're not necessarily supposed to interact and mess with it? Absolutely. It's our shrine. It's the altar. Okay. It's the space where you have your ancestors represented photographs. So photographs are fundamental. Because of our relationship, our bodies, to photography, this evidence that we exist and we have agency over these visuals is so important. But the, the cabinet is a shrine. Yeah. It is an altar. It is. It, it's very important there. Hello. Hi. My name hi. is Nicholas. Um, I had a question. It's regard to like self-displacement. I know you spoke, y'all spoke about it in some way or form. Is this idea of yourself being displaced within the front room, the back room, the side room, the middle room. Um, Sorry, being displaced or displayed? Displaced. So what does like self-displacement look like within your work or how do you try to mitigate it? Interesting. Um, how does um, self-displacement appear in your work and um, I guess thoughts about self-displacement as related to home? I don't know if I understand what you mean by self-displacement. Can you say a little bit more about I that? I understand what he's talking about. Okay. He's talking about kind of double consciousness in a way that, I mean, I'm born in the UK, but I'm never called British. I have to leave the country to be called English or British. Okay? So where does that place me in the Atlantic? Where am I? I said my parents are from St. Vincent. I, was Vin I claim to be a Vinci, even though when I go there, they call me English. I don't care. I'm hybrid. So we're continually aware of this double consciousness that somehow our blackness is through the lens of some whiteness. And we are life and death defined through our proximity to whiteness. That's always there. It's always present for me. And if that's what addresses your question, hopefully, maybe, I, I don't know. For me, um Oh, and we were talking about this at lunch too. I am an East African who looks like a lot of different things and I sound like a lot of different things. I was born in America, so I sound American depending on who I'm talking to. Um, I, I can do accents easily because like Trevor Noah, it's easier to talk to people in the accent that they understand. Um, um, we're East Africans, so we don't have the kind of lived in culture that a lot of West Africans do in terms of like what they wear and how they wear it and what it's used for. We wear oversized suits a lot. Um, <clears throat> and so I don't present as the thing. So there's always the like, oh, well, you're so blah, blah, blah for an African. Um, and it's annoying, but it's also, for me, it's an interesting way to observe and to be a mole and to take note of how people move and how, how things get done, I think. I feel like it makes me a little sharper, um, as an artist at least, um, to, because it's similar being in America too because people can't really play, like, are you American? But if you are, like, from what part exactly? Or maybe you're a Brit, you know, maybe you're from the islands, but we can't quite place what, because you pronounce your T's. Um, and so I'm able to kind of maneuver a little bit easier, I think, um, and eavesdrop a lot, <laughs> which is great. Well, um, um, I'm the f 50th generation of my family migrating in Brazil. Like my, my grandma and grandpa are from the north and then uh, migrate to the center where my mom's uh, born. And then my mom come to the south and where my father and me and my, my sister, we born. And where I live now, I think that it's a, that is a, a negative point in this because you, I don't know, I think, and me and my sister, we talk about a lot of this. It feels like you don't have a, 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 a land, I, I don't know. You are always looking for other places that you are going to build some roots or stuff like this, but I think this, 
this can never happen, maybe, but um, in, in my circle of friends and colleagues, um, we have this view of the country that some people don't have it. They, they don't have this uh, um, uh, generosity, I don't know, gener generosidade. Generalization? Oh, yes, to, 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 to look at other experiences. Mm -hmm. And um, I live in Sao Paulo, people in Sao Paulo used to think they, they are the Brazil. <laughs> And <laughs> this is a huge problem. And <laughs> so they think they, they can talk for everybody, they can uh, create for everybody, they, they are the, the Brazilian figure. So <laughs> uh, at this point that I'm, we are always migrating, my family, it's, it's good, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Oh, I see another question. I had I quickly wanted to ask you about, um, and are there, if there are people with mics, if you can raise your hand, so just so I have a sense of who's waiting, um, about curatorial practice and representation, because there's representation and design that you do in your own practice as an architectural designer, as architect, and then there's the curatorial part, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, navigating those aspects, does curating allow you to do something, did curating allow you to do something that designing you know, spaces didn't? Um, yes, yes, uh, curating made me be more political in the, in the, in the, uh, the professional, uh, because I, I started, I founded this project, uh, Black Female Architects, in 2018, and uh, I've been mapping the, uh, the production, not with this, this uh, particular objective. It was just to, to not feel alone in this, in this, in this work. And uh, when I start to look what they are, they were doing. I thought, whoa, this, this here, this, this professional here can be here, and this can be here if, it, if they have this interest in. So I started to to do the, this curator, like uh, almost naturally. But the curator, it's. I, I think it's uh, it's not the result, but it, it's a, a step in my research. I'm always a researcher, mm -hmm. and I I just uh, look at the opportunity that I have in the moment, and I I think about what can I bring to this opportunity. What is going to be the language that will allow me to speak what I've been researching? Okay, thank you. Question. Okay, there we are. Uh, thanks for sharing your combined experiences and how you've gone through representing the black home, right? So homes become more and more important to me. I've just come back from home in Manchester and realizing that over the course of my life, I've lived in various places. Um, I guess my question to you is, what does, I, I pose this question to my students recently, and it seems like we represent our homes through like very specific physical ways. So you spoke about, you know, the plastic on the sofa and so on, and the, the prayer hands. Is there something that, uh, like an object in your personal spaces, in your homes, that's indicative of the way in which you were raised or your blackness or what home means to you? And why is it? That's a really interesting. I, I, I mentioned music earlier. Um, it would be the, parent, the, the photos of my parents, because they're gone, and I speak to them. And, and it allows me to be, to connect on a spiritual level with them. Um, and it also speaks in a way to an aspect of my practice that can be guerrilla. I come from a theater background where we don't have no money, we're gonna do it anyway, we're gonna find a way to do it. 
And there's a piece here, making this piece where in Curacao, not in a gallery, in a migrant area, an outlaw area, which the installation was built on. I thought it would just last the day, surrounded by salt. And salt has a particular meaning in terms of our history, our bodies, ritual. And I thought the thing would last for a day. And in fact, it lasted for two weeks because people thought I was performing a ritual with the salt. That's really it. So connecting things with the body is really quite important. And having my parents um, sign is there. I also have a doll uh, created by a winter priestess from Suriname. She's my guardian. Her name is Amma. She's born on a Saturday. And I always have to... She guards. She, when you come in, she'll see you. She's about that high, and she's dressed, and she will speak to you. So those are quite important, and she travels with me. And I say that because uh, history is not in the past. After James Baldwin, it's in the present, because we carry our histories with us. So I think I kind of go back to these things, but also my body. It's also about where I feel. Like, I feel very at home here. So it's my body, really, the things around it that make me feel, give me pleasure, and make me feel... Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, for me, it is my father's artwork. Um, my dad was a painter and a graphic designer, and I grew up surrounded by his paintings. Um, specifically, he had a lot of nudes um, of women who all looked like my mom um, or had her shape. And so I grew up seeing pictures of voluptuous women so to a point where I didn't, it wasn't until like when most of us were going through puberty that I realized like not all women look the same because I just thought all women had big backsides. Um, <laughs> but it was a great way to grow up, um, specifically countering to you know what's in magazines and all of the things, and especially as growing up as a young black girl. Um, so there's a particular painting that my dad has of hair braiders that me and all of my siblings have in our homes, which is sort of standard issue. Um, and we were not allowed to have tourist art <laughs> in our homes. Um, my dad was very specific about this is not art. This is for tourists, you know, like the jumping Maasai's and the giraffes and things. We don't do that. Um, so that is not in my home. Um, and I have a lot of spices in my cabinet because I'm East African and we do a lot of spices. <laughs> we have a lot of Indian influence and we have Zanzibar and, you know, and that is specific to how I grew up as well. Well, in my house we have two elements. I, I think I can call like this one is, is a plant called, uh, in Portuguese, uh, Espada de São Jorge. It's a plant that we, we put in front of the, the first door. The yeah. The yeah, the entrance, yeah. And uh, it, it's for purify the home and make uh, the bad spirits away of the, the house. And in my house, we used to have, uh, and I'm very happy because I, I bought it one for my house. I found it one, bought it one. It's a, a carranca in Portuguese. We call carranca. It's like a sculpture in wood, like this, this tall, but you have a lot of sizes. And in my house, we had all over the place. My dad used to have the keys, uh, like a, this, I don't know how to call the... Yeah, key ring, and one in the front of the house, in the entrance, too. Yeah, yeah, it's from Bahia, yeah, Salvador. The crochet, my family's from Guyana, and if I see crochet, I know I'm... <laughs> no. yeah. um, were there other questions? Hi, um, thank you all for sharing more about your work and all your experience. My name is Buma, and my question is, uh, for those of you who have, um, with your work, a practice of working with other participants or people in the community as you're representing, not necessarily your own space or a space that you're creating, but 
their space or other people's spaces. Uh, if you can describe your practice and how you um, work through, um, I'm thinking about like care and respect uh, and intimacy and maintaining that uh, as some people may not be comfortable with publicizing certain things or certain ideas or, or just getting comfortable with their space or their home or their their being being on such a wide uh, platform? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I work a lot with oral histories, and from the outset, it's always about an ethics uh, applied to work because uh, someone's story is their life. And for me, it's always about consent, and it's developing a, um, a trust. And when I come in to someone's home, it's always about permission. I'm always going to share something of where I come from so they can develop a relationship of trust. And in sourcing materials for the front room, wherever I, it's iterated, such as in the Netherlands, which I took nothing from London because I was interested in what is similarly different across the diaspora, working with Moroccan, Indonesian, Ceremonies, and Antillian communities, spending time, gaining trust. And if people are not want to share uh, something or want to remain anonymized, that's absolutely fine. So one can only go as, you know, at each stage with, with someone's um, allowance to, to, to come into their home and to come into their story. That, for me, is a, a really important principle to maintain those ethics. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question because it's so um, important and it's so loaded. Um, in the space that I'm working in now, it's, it's, I think it's a little easier when I'm doing smaller independent projects, but as a black person, as a black woman from Africa, you know, I get a lot of like, let's make a film about little, you know, like I have a thousand biopics on my, um, on my desk that, you know, would be great blockbuster films about someone important. Um, and so it's, part of it is educating the people that I work with, the producers that I work with, in terms of the importance of speaking to who's, who, who's there, what part of the family is still there, we need to speak to them. Yes, it might change our story, it might interfere with things, but we do need their blessings. Um, and you know, usually the way to say that is like, we don't want them picketing outside the movie theater when we finish the film. And then they're like, yeah, 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 we definitely need to talk to the families. Um, and you know, if they're dead, do we need to venerate ancestors? Do we need blessings from beyond <laughs> in order to make sure that this is gonna happen and will be successful? And, you know, we have their permission. Um, and making sure that we get the story right, so not just, yeah, I mean, there's things that you dramatize because, you know, it's not a documentary. Um, I don't work in the documentary space, I work in narrative. Um, but, you know, if we're, if we're going to narrativize things, how are we doing it in a respectful way? How are we doing it how am I gaining trust with these people so that they're, they're trusting me to tell a story that they think will still give them dig dignity at the end of the day? Um, because I've been on the receiving end of that, of people speaking in Swahili, and it's like a language no one's ever heard of before, or you know, using some random name from whatever, or everybody's wearing kente cloth, but they're not all from Ghana, you know, just things that have, I, I mean, I, to me, the best example and one I really appreciated actually was Black Panther and the amount of research that went into representing people who didn't really exist but could. Um, and I'd never seen anyone, especially at that level of filmmaking or industry, spend that much time, because especially when it comes to black people, People are so happy to just mow over it. And also having the conversation of if you were representing an important story about white people from Boston and you had people speaking in a Valley accent, 
Like, I'd never get a job again. <laughs> you, know? you, you could never do that if you, had, if you were telling the story of Abe Lincoln and the person had a Scottish accent or was like some blonde Swedish looking person. Like, it's not, it's not gonna work and you would be so upset. And we deserve the same kind of respect for our work because we have that much and so much more in term diversity within our communities. <laughs> Um, for me, it's, it's difficult because when I'm working with this big uh, Brazilian institution, it's very difficult to make them understand that uh, if we work with communities, it's, we are not going to send an email to invite them to be in the Venice Biennale because it doesn't matter at all for them. <laughs> You know, so I have to go there to invite them. I have to go there and explain why, why I think it's important for we create together a project to bring to, to Venice Biennale. And um, they are this logic of doing that it's very difficult to, to make them understand that we have to have eye contact and uh, these people have this rich knowledge and they won't, they are so tired to being stolen mm -hmm. and uh, they are very, how can I say, close to this kind of, of working opportunity. In the other hand, when I'm in my studio, when I'm uh, creating a project for a client, I'm, I always ask you, have the time to create this with me because this is a co-creation. Okay, so we have to, to make this together and has been working with some difficulties, but has been working. <laughs> and uh, in, in Venice, um, that we have this experience to create the whole um, project with the, the Terreiro da Casa Branca in Salvador. And uh, with an indigenous community in, in Amazonas and stuff like this, me and Paulo, that was my partner, we divided, uh, we separated, and he goes to Amazonas and I to um, me to to Bahia because we only have four months to do this, so it was very crazy. And uh, but the the community when we were in Venice and we won the Golden Lion, they, they made a, a carnival in Salvador. So they, they thought that they were part, a part of the work. So I think the whole process bring them to the, to the situation. And then when we come back to Brazil with the, the award, the first place that we, we went was there and bring to the community, so uh, they are part, uh, a huge part of the process. I think it, it, it has, uh, it has, they were present in all the development of the project. I love, you know, it's the idea of um, kind of bringing home with you, um, connecting with people, making home together almost, and bringing them with you. I think we're almost out of time. I wanted to just ask if there's, you know, something that is missing from home or that you would want to see more of, and we can leave it with, with that. What are we hoping for representations of home in the future? I don't know. I, uh, it's a recognition for me that we are creating home, we do create home, but we don't know that we are. We're constantly, someone talked earlier, uh, a fellow elder like myself, that we are, we're constantly doing this. And why? Because as humans, as black people, wherever there is oppression, we, there is resistance. And we always, whatever it's a hut or a small place, we'll always create some sense of beauty. We're continually doing that. That is something that, to remind ourselves that we constantly do. Um, what I hope to see in our future or, you know, I mean, so much of my work has been my remembrance of 
what my childhood was like and what I want to bring forward and sort of unpacking why we did the things we did in the way we did. Um, and I feel like, you know, the next generation following will probably do the same about us. <laughs> and so trying to think about what it is that I would love to gift, gift to them to represent about me or, you know, my people, if it's my children, what would I want them to say about their mother in the way that I talk about my mother? Um, you know, and then and that comes from what's important to me and what I've been able to figure out um, in my life and in sort of the wild world, wide world life and just the world experiences that I've had and the people I've been able to talk to and interface with and like bringing all of this information um, and having that be part of the broader story so that it's not just about me in my little corner or our people in our little corner in the one little language that we speak, but it's a lot broader and has connections to all, to Brazil and to the UK and to all the places. Well, I hope we keep uh, understanding that uh, this sense of beauty that we have in our house, uh, houses, and it's uh, a way of thinking and design and architecture, and has to be considered like this, and um, because it's a way of do that is very different of what we used to to learn in schools of architecture and design. So, I hope we can keep considering this and talking about this in conferences like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect, thank you, a way of thinking. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.